Hello, welcome to the Ghosts of Harrenhal. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode four of our chapter by chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire series by George R. R. Martin. Hey, you got all that right. I that did. Time. That was perfect. <laughs> Today we're discussing chapter three of A Game of Thrones, Daenerys One. How's things? Good. Good. Do you yeah. uh, you you recovered? You've had a, a long night and morning. I have. Yeah, I went to see went to see a band last night. The band Ride from uh, England. Cool. R I D E. Yeah. They, um, and I've just finished watching Derry Girls on. Um, Netflix, and so I kept calling them Royd. <laughs> <laughs> Royd. Royd. <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, while you were out partying, I was watching Aladdin with my uh, daughter. So we both had pretty raucous right, nights, exactly. I feel like. I, I may talk too too loud because my ears are ringing from <laughs> right. how loud it was. At this I'll ring you in <laughs> yeah. if you start shouting. Good. All right, we'll start with the summary of the chapter. Uh, then what we'll do for the rest of the podcast is we discuss what we th- what we think of it. We'll provide you with some useful background information that you might not know, and n- not that it will spoil it for you, but it'll help to sort of color it, color things in. A quick bit of pedantry. There isn't much this time. Notes and corrections from previous episodes. Yes, it was bound. Yeah, wow. And we'll finish with some listener mail. Yeah, exciting. We've got mail. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we'll start with our usual summary of the chapter. Over to you, McKelly. All right. We find the last Targaryens, Danny, age 13, and her brother Viserys, age 21, in the home of Illyrio Mopatis, a magister of Pentos on the continent of Essos. Danny is getting ready to attend a party at the manse of Cal Drogo, the leader of the feared Dothraki tribe. Viserys hopes that Drogo, the leader of a hundred thousand strong army, will ask to wed Danny tonight, cementing an alliance that is crucial to Viserys' ambitions. Danny is careful not to upset her brother due to his temper. After Viserys leaves, Danny reminisces about her life to this point and how she ended up here. She recalls the story of Viserys and their pregnant mother fleeing King's Landing at the end of Robert's Rebellion, Danny's birth on Dragonstone and her mother's dying in childbirth, their eventual escape to Essos under the care of Sir Willem Derry, the series of places they lived and had been forced to flee, afraid of the usurper Robert's assassins, at every turn, Viserys insists that the threat is real, but Danny is skeptical. During the ride to the Cow's Mance, Viserys dreams of reclaiming his throne. At the party, while Magister Illyrio goes to get Cal Drogo, Danny gets cold feet and begs her brother to leave and go home. Viserys tells Danny that he would let Cal Drogo's whole Calisar have relations with her to get the army he needs to take the Iron Throne. Danny stiffens her resolve and prepares to meet her future husband. So yeah, that's that's it. It's, it's the longest chapter we've read so far. But but actually, when you summarize it, not an awful lot happens. Really. Right. <laughs> a lot of reminiscing. A lot of reminiscing is, is most of it. Yeah. yeah. But but there are Targaryens. I mean, yes, it, they survive. Yes, they're not all they're not wiped out. It's um, like cockroaches, you can't <laughs> kill them all. Well, <laughs> arguably, these could be the good guys. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but the cockroaches may be the good guys. True. I mean, perhaps in their minds, we're the vermin. Yeah. Actually, I I. I killed a cockroach in my house the other day and it took me so many swipes at this thing that my wife shouted is it is it a small amphibian <laughs> <laughs> it took me like 12 swipes at this thing uh, those th- palmetto bugs for for those who don't live in, in our neck of the woods yeah. you might not be familiar with but I, 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 I was telling someone that story yesterday, one of the people who went to the concert with me, and they said, it's not a palmetto bug, it's a roach. <laughs> I was like, okay. Yes, palmetto bugs are American cockroaches, okay. but they are not the infestation kind, like okay. German cockroaches. I feel a lot more. Yes. I, I did not know. Well, when we first moved here, we had a palmetto bug in the house, and uh-huh. Stacy was like, ah! And so we got a, we brought the orchid man in, and he was like, yeah, that's just a palmetto <laughs> bug. And he explained the difference to me. That's so very exciting. You do not have an infestation of cockroaches in your house. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> but those things move fast. Those, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. The, they're... And, and they just they hide in the corners. They do. We, we, we need to make an invention. We, we've, we've discussed this before. <laughs> right. We need an invention for squishing <laughs> A corner-shaped hammer. A corner-shaped hammer. That's what we need. Uh, we're off track. Yes, we, yeah. we did get off track. So, one of the things that I noticed is that Viserys claims that the throne was taken by treachery. I'm not one hundred percent sure what he's referring to there because big. his his brother, who was the crown prince, was killed in combat right by Robert. Robert, yeah, that's at the no trident. One. And his father dies. Yes. Uh, if I were to take a guess, I would assume he's talking about that one. 
Yeah, presumably, the, yeah. The Kingslayer killing King Ares. We can't go too much into... No, we have to be a little bit you know, He does reference that the Kingslayer is a Lannister. Yes. We don't know who, which Lannister is the yes, Kingslayer. We. And we don't quite know what the King, what Kingslayer means, but right. there are clues in that word, I think. Yes. I, I don't believe it was a title he was given <laughs> by the king. If I get out of control, <laughs> it's your job. Put me back in my place. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we sort of learned in Eris and Varys's, uh, sorry, Viserys's, yes. that was a spoiler, <laughs> Viserys's uh, relationship it's easy to sympathize with Daenerys. Yes, yeah, definitely. Is a she's a bit of a bounder, really. He's, he is, yes. The chapter, its point is a, it revolves around their relationship, basically. Yeah. The, the things he wants from her and the things she doesn't want to do, but doesn't want to displease him. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I think there's an interesting depth to it. The fact that she literally wasn't even born on Westeros itself. I mean, she was born right. on Dragonstone, which is an island oh, off of island. Westeros. Right. So she's never even been there and certainly doesn't remember even Dragonstone. And so this whole claim to the Iron Throne for her is just completely abstract. And she right, doesn't. yeah. Viserys does remember it, and so I can kind of see from his perspective his need to, you know, the burning ambition to get back. She is... Yeah, it's so true. abstract to her that she doesn't see it as the as the ultimate end game for them. She she remembers happier times during their exile. That's a I feel like it's a major theme of this chapter is the the major contrast between their wishes. Viserys is obsessed with winning back his throne and claiming Westeros, and meanwhile, Danny just wants to go back to the big house with the red door yeah, and the yeah. lemon tree that yeah. she considers her home. Yeah, which is nice, and it's kind of sad for her as well. It's kind of. Uh... Yeah, it's easy to be, easy to be uh, sympathetic with her, or at least relatively sympathetic. Again, I'm not sure that the Targaryens are going to be the heroes of this book. Right. So she's a 13 year old girl trapped in a, yeah, in a tough situation. Yeah, she is. No yeah, but it's it becomes clear pretty quickly that she is not much more than a commodity at this point yeah. to the series that he plans to exploit. He clearly doesn't have a ton of care for her well being, and. Um, he, I think right off the bat, he lets her know right at the start of the chapter that her job is to win the affections of Khal Drogo because he needs an army. Yeah, yeah. And we know what happens if he displeases her. Yes. Well, we don't. No. Well, we know what it's called. <laughs> it's called Waking the Dragon. But... <laughs> Which, based on his treatment of her before the she dragon wakes is him, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine that it would be pleasant, her waking the dragon. The, the, the funny thing about it is, I mean, calling losing your temper something just seems like the <laughs> ultimate sort of like <laughs> sort of refuge of the, of the douchebag. Right. <laughs> like, that is a, a major douchebag. Yeah. That is something like prototypical yeah. douchebag move right uh, there. You lot, you lose your temper, but I, with me, the dragon. You wake in the dragon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, we we learn about their f- how they ended up in Pentos, which is sort of an interesting backstory. Yeah. Viserys, at the point where all of the the Robert's rebellion comes to its successful conclusion, so Rhaegar, their brother, is killed. Yep. Their father is killed by the, the Kingslayer. Kingslayer. Their Rhaegar's wife and her children are murdered. That's Elia Martell yeah, and her children. Which leaves, at that time, Viserys and his mother as the only two living Targaryens. Danny is uh, in utero right. at that time, yep. so they're the only two. Danny and Viserys' mother is also the king's sister, as well as, right. as, yes. well as their mother. So which we both will... aunt and mother. Yes. A little bit unpleasant. Um <laughs> So they flee to Dragonstone, King's Landing falls to Robert Baratheon's armies, and mm-hmm. Dragonstone is fairly impregnable, but also not particularly yeah. hospitable. You're not going to live a lavish life yeah. in Dragonstone. It's pretty um, much a rock. And then the sort of like the perhaps the key to well, I mean, uh, this is this is a debatable point, but the key to their relationship might be the fact that Danny's mother dies in childbirth. You know, that's yes. uh, that clearly is. He a grudge. Is, yeah, I mean, his his life was in horrible turmoil. And his one fixed point was his mother. Right. And to lose her. He was eight? Is that I right? I think that's the numbers that, that how it works so. out. Yeah, so. So that's, that's pretty rotten for him. But, right. But actually, whilst it might underpin their relationship, it seems that the reason for his mistreatment of her is all around his ambition rather than 
uh, rather than hatred for her because she killed his mother, yep. it's all about his ambition. Yeah, really. That's, she's a commodity. Yeah. Not some. He doesn't seem to have like personal vendetta hatred yeah. toward her. Yeah, right. and then so they were they were they fled from Dragonstone to Essos, which is the other major continent on the on this world. Right uh, under the uh, care of Sir William Darry, he was an old man and later dies, leaving them basically as yeah destitute. Yeah. At, at the mercy of others, basically. Yeah, yeah. They spend their the rest of their lives as guests in someone else's home. And yeah. he picks up the moniker Beggar King. Yeah. Which is not Yeah. Which I mean of course I mean if you if you discount Robert's rebellion, he is the natural king of Westeros. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, He's <laughs> that it's pretty legit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His father was the king and he was the he was the heir. Once Rhaegar was dead, he was the heir. Well, once Rhaegar and his children were dead. All right, so let's let's do this. Let's play some word association involving <laughs> Viserys. I feel like there a lot of words can come to mind when you think of him. You got anything? Oh, you want me to start? <laughs> well, he's he's pretty cruel. Yes, that's for sure. Obsessed, and that certainly is part of it. Yeah, he also is kind of like sort of childishly peevish. You know, sort of yes. like just yes, malicious with his revenge on her. He and does things. seem very childlike in his yeah. temperament he's also rather deluded yeah i think so although i mean you know he like like we said he is the rightful king yes but, but he, recognizing the reality of their situation yeah he's, he's he's failing on that it seems yeah he's also very unsure of himself i mean he's he's sort of fragile his ego is enormous but fragile you know you, right. you, you sense that some of the things that uh, illyrio uh, mopatis says to him Danny's picking up that this is just flattery, right? And, yep. and, and uh, Viserys just can't see it, or or he doesn't see it as easily. And that's that's actually one of the criticisms I have of this chapter a little bit is is how one dimensional he is compared he, to Danny. He is right, yep, he and is. I think there's a he's there's, just a bad guy. You yeah, know, he, he is just a comes off bad. as just a bad guy. And I, I think part of it is is one of the themes of the book, which is that children of incest are often troubled. Oh, I yeah. think that's one of the things that comes up again and again in the book as sure. a theme. And so yeah. I think that's part of why he's not given too many redeeming qualities. Because I think this is he actually wants to reinforce that. It is, if, you, if you're a child of incest, there's a chance you're going to be wrong to the core. Speaking of that, maybe we should discuss a little bit about Targaryens yeah. and incest. Uh, that is something that they have practiced at least back to Aegon the Conqueror. I, I don't. I assume it goes back to... And how long is that? Is that 300 years? 300 years, yeah. So, in the history of Westeros, Targaryens have always, almost, not not always, but for the vast majority of their marriages, were incestual. And, and it's because they're the last great house of Valeria, which we'll talk a little more specifically about Valeria in the background. Incest keeps the bloodline pure, is their thinking. However, all of the series talk about pure bloodlines, which he mentions that he talks to her about the importance of keeping pure bloodlines. He's selling her to a, a barbarian stranger. That's true. That is true. Which, but maybe he's hoping that no issue comes from that, and that you right. know, once he's got a the one-off. throne back, he gets rid of Khal Drogo and right. takes over. Yes. Yeah. Illyrio has a quote. He's referring to Danny's appearance, and he says that silver gold hair, purple eyes, she is the blood of old Valyria. And that's a traditional Targaryen look. Or, so is it the a Targaryen look or, or a Valyrian look? I think both. Right, I right. think it, it is the typical Targaryen look because it's probably but the because typical. of the fall of the doom of Valyria, they are one of the few families left who look like that. Yes. I see. Which, yeah, I mean, I can see why you might want to keep it. But I think if you look at their family tree, and uh, it's probably... It's a little spoilery to look at the family tree. They they are not a hundred percent incestuous. I think. Correct. I actually think they're they're related to Robert. In fact, I think there's a Baratheon not far back in their family yes. tree. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I believe you are correct. Yeah. Uh, one thing that, that that stood out to me because it happened several times in the chapter is Danny refers to Viserys' borrowed sword. I'm doing finger uh, quotes, yeah, finger which quotes, is yeah. perfect for yeah, yeah, yeah. a podcast. We'll learn. Uh, <laughs> Multiple times she references his borrowed sword for no reason. Yeah. Just say his sword. But I I wonder if that's an intentional in her mind 
everything about him is borrowed. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it is really. I mean, yeah, they've got they they are basically penniless. So she maybe she sees him as a beggar king as well. Yeah. So, um, Magister Illyrio of Mopatis is a, an interesting character, sort of super wealthy it seems, but. Danny certainly doesn't trust him, but but actually, I was thinking about this a little bit, and her her lack of trust for him, whilst understandable, I actually think his his motives are pretty clear. You know, he reckons that if he helps this exiled king, should this exiled king ever get back, right, he's, he's gonna, in good graces. He's, yeah, exactly, good graces with the king. I don't think he's actually being malicious to them. I think he's, you know, right. He, I just don't think. He, particularly cares if they succeed no yeah. but you know there's not a lot of investment involved and there that's just, the thing, yeah. he's got a big house yeah, exactly. <laughs> give him a few rooms yeah. and you know buy low <laughs> sell, sell high, high. <laughs> yeah for sure yeah. Yeah. so yeah it's clear Danny she says multiple times she doesn't trust him right and Viserys doesn't come across that he doesn't trust him he does he mentions what you just said he, Danny says why is he doing this and he says yeah because he knows when I become king I'll take care of my people right and then and that's and that's to Viserys' credit I mean he's not just thinking this guy likes me he, because right, I'm awesome right yeah, I mean, he's my best friend yeah. <laughs> yeah did you notice there's a reference to a Mormont I just wanted to make sure because we had a Mormont reference in the prologue as well you see Right here, right now, this is the advantage of listening to this podcast. Because if you weren't listening to this podcast, you would not remember that back in the prologue, the, uh, there was a Mormont mentioned, the Sir Geor. Sir Geor Mormont. Yes. The, the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Right. This is not the same. He's not traveling from the Night's Watch over to <laughs> Pentos. <laughs> well, not... I do love a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I'll break my vows. <laughs> this is Sir Jorah Mormont. He is the son of... Sir Gior Mormont, Gior being the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, yeah. Sir Jorah, an exiled knight. Uh -huh. So just wanted to point that out and make sure the difference was understood. Uh, other thing to notice, that there seems to be a different prim primary religion here on Essos. Yeah, right. We're talking about these red priests of the Lord of Light. Um, that I didn't get a mention on Westeros, so that it's I'm not sure it's the primary religion of Essos, but certainly seems to be prevalent here. In uh, yes, although I think she mentioned it in more than Pentos. I think she actually mentioned seeing the Red Priest in a different city as well. So, it seems that it is the, the 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 first, the most important religion here in Essos. Caitlin did not mention it when she was comparing the old gods in the faith. No, yeah. So, might uh, not have much of a foothold on yeah, Westeros. Yeah. My personal favorite part of the entire chapter is uh, Viserys listing the families that he believes would be loyal to his cause, because I think that's uh, that's where the story's got some real interest for me. Is uh, what I love about the story is the sort of political intrigue and the sort of like the right. families sort of like jockeying for position, like a uh, Game of Thrones. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> I'm proud of that. Yeah. Um, so he mentions the Tyrells, the Redwines, the Darries, the Greyjoys, and the Martells. Um, right. And they, they have their reasons. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But, yes, uh, yes I, I, I really like that. I, I mean, it's a it's a lot to keep up with because there's this proliferation of families and characters. Some of the some of those on that list are going to be important in the story, and some are not. Right. So it's again just sort of building that that, that richness to it, which I really enjoy. There's a lot of houses that get uh, talked yeah. about. Yeah. The other thing is that they mentioned the skulls of dragons adorning King's Landing. What? If the skulls of dragons, that would mean there would be dragons, presumably. Right. Or at least there had been dragons. So that's a third mystical entity in that as we're many chapters. With. Yes. It's crazy. <laughs> okay. Apparently, this is not our world. All right. So, in comparison with the TV show, it's a little bit different. Danny meets Cal Drogo in a separate encounter. She meets him two times, basically, in the, in the. Uh, TV show wants for him to sort of inspect her and decide whether or not he wants her. Um, the other thing, the, th the bigger thing, I think, is that the Dothraki are, are nomadic people. They right. seem to be more nomadic in the book. Uh, sorry, more Less nomadic. Nomadic. Yeah, yeah, more nomadic in the TV show. Right. The he uh, Cal Drogo has a large manse in Pentos with two hundred rooms. Yeah. There was no sense of that in the TV show. I, I mean, would like were... one of those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pentos looks nice. Yes. Yeah. We never saw any Dothraki and anything more substantial than a tent in the right. TV shows. So yeah. it's interesting that that's a, that's a difference. Yeah. And uh, you've noticed a, a difference in timeline. In full disclosure, 
I currently do not have access to HBO. So <laughs> Simon's doing all of the comparison with the TV show. All I can base it on is my memory. Because... Yeah, so, so almost all of the young characters in the book have been aged slightly for the TV show. Right. With the exception of the of the the literal children, the um, the Stark children and Robert's children as well, they're they're of the right age. So oh, almost, uh, nobody oh, yeah. almost nobody then. Almost nobody's well, been aged. Right. Well, Rickon's supposed to be three. Right. And so we we did notice that John and Rob were both a little bit older. Yeah. I mean, the actors were older than the characters were supposed to be. But in a strange version, Viserys is actually younger in the show than he was in the book. So by our reckoning, he would have been twenty one in the book. But he claims to have been waiting 17 years for his throne. Yeah, so. I, I had a thought. I, I was just wondering if, for the TV show, it's going to a mass TV audience and maybe making Danny. I don't remember what age they made her, if they even said what yeah, age she was in the TV it, yeah. show, but 13 year old bride might be a bit much for yeah, a yeah. TV audience to yeah. take. Um, Illyrio Mapatis is. Not quite as yeah. revolting. A character. <laughs> right. I mean, physically revolting a character. <laughs> when yeah. I was reading the chapter, and you know, Danny refers to rolls of fat that jiggled as he walked, yeah. and Danny could smell the stench of Illyrio's pallid flesh through his heavy perfumes. I'm not painting a very pretty picture. No, not exactly. And so I was like, I don't remember what this character looked like. So <laughs> I went, I pulled him up, and I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. That's disappointing, and he doesn't even have the fancy yellow forked beard. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, um, non-spoiler background information. So, um, got a lot. We do have a lot this time. So, Rhaegar is the elder brother of Viserys and Danny. He was crown prince behind his father, Aerys II. Uh, he himself was killed by Robert Baratheon during Robert's Rebellion. So, we learned that a Lannister killed the king. We're not sure which one. Right. We also heard about. Unsullied, which is actually off a different topic here. When they arrive at Khal Drogo's manse, they meet someone who they described as unsullied, and then uh, Viserys refers to him as a eunuch. Right. So I'm not 100% sure what the unsullied are, but apparently they are. At least this are. one is a eunuch. Yeah. yeah. We get a little geography lesson on Essos. They mention the free cities, and there are nine free cities that are found in the west of the continent of Essos, which is the continent to the east of Westeros, which, well-named, Westeros is to the west yeah. of Essos. It's, they're, they're separated by the Narrow Sea, and they're called free cities because they are their own city-states. All but one, which is Bravos, was founded by the Valerian Freehold. Interesting. So the Narrow Sea is not completely well named. I mean it's it's a couple of hundred miles, I yeah, think. It's yeah. not it's not like it's not an ocean. Right. But it's not like a river. A small channel. Yeah. yeah. It's it's you'd it's, have to make a conscious decision to sail across it. Yes. Which is why the first men are the first men, because yeah. if it was just a river everyone, lots of everyone would be spilling across it, yes. They'd have to go way back <laughs> yeah. to find the first men. So Valeria so Valeria is a city uh, full of magic and dragon riders. I liked your Last week, your reference to, now I forget it, Atlantis. Atlantis. I really struggled, yes. <laughs> yeah. I really struggled. With that. I, that, I had never thought of that, but that's, yeah. that's a very good analogy. Anyway, yeah. continue. So it was the capital of the Valyrian Freehold, which controlled much of Essos. It was destroyed during an event known as the Doom of Valyria, Ooh. presumably some kind of tectonic thing. Yes. Most of what made Valyria so powerful was lost in the Doom. The only dragon riders who escaped were the Targaryens, who then moved to Dragonstone, which was just off the coast of Westeros. They'd moved there 12 years prior to the Doom, in fact. Yeah, that was kind of their summer home, I guess. That uh, was the, a place they went to. Uh, interesting. But interestingly, the Targaryens were considered a lesser house of Valeria. Well, lesser house of Valeria is still a greater house of everybody else. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we, we hear about Dragonstone. We have referenced it a little bit that it's not exactly a, a place you'd want to stay for too long. Yeah. It's As I just said, it's the original Westerosi seat of House Targaryen. And after Aegon's conquest, uh, roughly 300 years prior to the start of our story here, the seat of Targaryen power moved to King's Landing. However, the Targaryens still consider Dragonstone an important stronghold. The heir apparent... To the king is usually called the Prince of Dragonstone. Yeah. They they refer to Danny as the Princess of Dragonstone when they arrive at uh, Caldrogo's. Right. 
So, yeah, we mentioned the four houses that um, Viserys referenced. So just a bit of background on them. The Tyrells, House Tyrell is one of the great houses of the Seven Kingdoms. They are the lords paramount of the Manda and liege lords of the Reach. They're second only to the Lannisters in wealth in Westeros. Their seat is High Garden, which was once the seat of rule in Westeros. The Reach has very fertile lands which generate their wealth. The sigil is a gold rose on a green field. Their words are growing strong. The current lord is Mace Tyrell. And we learned about the Red Wines. Their home is also in the Reach, and they owe fealty to the Tyrells. Conveniently enough, their seat is in the Arbor. A hotbed of Targaryenism. Right. Yes, yeah, the Reach. Their seat is in the Arbor, which is an island off the southwest coast of Westeros. They're known for their wine production, which is pretty important yeah. in Westeros. Mm. Oh, and it is the best. Uh, yeah. It's the known as the best wine in Westeros. They also have the largest fleet in the Seven Kingdoms, which makes them pretty important allies. Their sigil is Burgundy Grape Cluster on blue. And oddly, uh, one of the few houses without words. Oh, interesting. Yes. And their lord is Paxter Redwine. Maybe they uh, were partaking too much in yeah, the possibly. wine to... <laughs> the words were slurred, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what they're so, saying. So interesting that they have the largest fleet in the Seven Kingdoms. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised to hear that. I mean, I would have thought that it was the Greyjoys. I would have thought that the, being from the Iron Islands and being what they are, they would have the larger fleet. Maybe just... A, but numerically, it's a smaller place. Yes, yeah. I, I would yeah. think that would have something to do with it. We'll get to the Great Joys in a minute, but uh, yeah. yeah um. So um, House Dari makes its home in the Riverlands. They were once a very prominent house of the Trident until the fall of the Targaryens. They really stuck by the Targaryens, and they uh, were punished for it in the, yes. when Robert succeeded. They actually fought against Robert Baratheon, and against their own liege lord, because Hosta Tully would have been there. Uh, being from the Riverlands, they owed their fealty to Tully's, and they, so they fought against him. Right. Their sigil's a black plowman on a, on brown. Their lord is Lady Maria Darry, presumably somebody who's been put in place at the expense of whoever was removed from there for their... I'm guessing that was Willem Darry, okay. who was... Oh, the one who rescued Yes, the he kids. was referenced right, yeah. uh, by Daenerys, who she was... She seemed to be fond of him, yeah. uh, and he's the one that helped them get from Dragonstone yeah, yeah. over to Essos. So, House Greyjoy uh -huh. is, uh, is another of the great houses of the Seven Kingdoms. Uh, they rule a group of islands off the west coast of Westeros called the Iron Islands. It's a rather barren archipelago with very little fertile land. They reeve and plunder for much of what they have... <laughs> I, I read that uh, had re <laughs> had reap. You know, you're Sleek. like what? <laughs> Literally the opposite of what. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! Meant reeve. They reeve and plunder. That's kind of their thing. Their seat is called Pike, and their sigil is a golden kraken on a black field, which is a pretty cool sigil. That is a cool sigil. And uh, their words are, "We do not sow," which or, or reap. <laughs> right. <laughs> we do not sow or reap. <laughs> their lord is Bail on Greyjoy. So the other house that didn't get mentioned by name but by implication are the Martells of Dawn. They're the most obvious ally of the Targaryens because their daughter, Elia Martell, was married to Rhaegar. So right. they're not all incestuous. Yes. Right, yes. And she was murdered along with her two children when King's Landing fell. Uh, none of that can sit too no. well with the Martells, I would imagine. Yes, I mean, yeah. They're part of the Seven Kingdoms. They owe their fealty to King Robert, but that's got a sting. In this instance, well, in, uh, with these houses, I think uh, Viserys is probably right on most of them. I, I would think so. They I all have an so. axe to grind yeah. against uh, the Baratheons. Yeah, uh, but I would think that the stronger ones would be the the Martells, the Greyjoys, and the Darys. Yes. I think that the uh, Red Wines and the Tyrells are probably rich and successful enough to not really care right. who's in charge. They just want stability so they continue to be wealthy. I don't think... You're, but yeah. but it sort of depends on what their own ambitions are. You know, their their ambitions... You know, if they're... Um, well, what would your ambition be if you're, if you're already the second richest family in Westeros? Right. You know, so so that, that... I would imagine that their uh, fealty is fairly fungible and not too... Whoever's in the whoever's sitting the Iron Throne, as long as they get to maintain their yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. Oh, well, there. Well said. Thank you. That's <laughs> what I was trying to say. 
pedantry. There's very little pedantry, I'm afraid. I thought I just, you know, like I said, I thought Viserys could be a bit more nuanced. Right. Um, I was a little bit surprised. That, I have to be careful spoilers here, but I was very surprised to see that the Dothraki would hire an Unsullied. They pride themselves on being uh, on their own sort of combat yeah, prowess. I hadn't even thought of that and until you just it, mentioned that right now. It's a little bit strange because later we're going to discover that the Unsullied have their own military prowess, and so right. The fact that the Dothraki hired them seems just a bit odd to me. But That's a good point. We'll I had not thought of that. What did you say about uh, what arrived before? We've got mail. What? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> Woo. We're off and running with our correspondences from our listeners. Go on, then. So, we have, a, we, we have an email. And uh, the subject of the email is surname question. And I think this has to do with the terrible job I did in episode two of trying to explain <laughs> why want, John is a bastard. Do you want, do you want me to leap to your defense here? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, McKenna, you did fine. I, I basically explained what a bastard is. <laughs> I don't know that I did a very good job of <laughs> Even <explaining>. that. <laughs> I did a not so great job explaining the, what the makes a bastard. used to understand what a bastard was. <laughs> now I'm totally lost. So she first says some really nice things about our oh, podcast. Which, don't, don't read those. I yes, read those right. What she does want to know is, uh, she says, I would like to know more about surnames and bastards. In episode two, you mentioned that Jon Snow is a bastard because he isn't the son of Eddard and his wife. Is that it? Or is there more to it? Which was what I was trying so poorly <laughs> To do. Also, do people who aren't lords and ladies have surnames? <laughs> so, may I try again? Please. <laughs> First of all, our, our <clears throat> editing skills have improved, so we should be able to get this down to <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> uh, no, people who are not lords and ladies, who are also referred to as small folk, Lisa admits she's just starting into this world, so she wouldn't know that yet. Uh, small folk do not have traditional last names as as we would consider last names. Uh, they can use the area where they're from as a sort of surname. For example, Tom from Flea Bottom, which is a poor section in King's Landing. Uh, but otherwise, Tom would just be Tom or maybe Tom the Butcher. Now to the bastard part of the question. Aside from being born from unwed parents, which I, I did convey, I believe, you in did. episode you two, this is where I stopped conveying. A bastard must be recognized by his lord father, which I believe you mentioned. If that happens, the child is given the name assigned to the bastards of lords from that particular region. So the, in the S north, it's snow. snow. So John is John Snow. There's others, such as the crownlands or water, and the reach or flowers, and so on and so forth. Uh, the Riverlands are rivers. Yes, yes, yes. they are. Was oh, that it? Oh, good. Uh, well, yeah. Well, thank uh, you. Please. I could keep going, no, but no. I think I... Yeah, I think I got it. it. I, I hope That's I answered it. your question, so, Lisa. So basically you're telling me that ordinary people don't even have surnames, so their being a bastard or not is neither here nor Correct. there. Yes, they, it doesn't, they don't get a fake last name. And you only get the standard last name, the snow, the rivers, the waters, if you're recognized as a bastard. Yes. I see. Interesting. Yes. Interesting. So uh, notes and corrections. Um, in the Cat Catlin chapter, we failed to notice that the fact that Lisa Aaron fled the capital was in the book, but in the TV, that news was postponed to a later scene between Ned and Cat, and seen as much more portentous news in the TV show. Right, I, well, I do book. remember that scene. Yeah. Right? We, we're still pretty far into early into episode one of the TV show. Right? Yeah, a lot of this is still in episode one. Yeah. 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 I know where episode one ends, and we're not there we're yet. Not there yet. So that's no, true. Yeah. I had to think back then, but yeah, I do too. Okay. I think we've talked about all we need to talk about here. Yeah, we? Okay. I think so. So it's beginning to get really fun now, I think. You're going to yeah. see how the bigger fe feces? <laughs> <laughs> feces? <laughs> the bigger pieces of the story are beginning to fit together. The Targaryens versus the Baratheons. Right. The old regime right. versus the new. Right. We've met what's left of the former most powerful house in all of Westeros. Now just two youngsters living off the generosity of others and yeah. pseudo-hiding. Yeah. That's... And they themselves could not be more different from one another. They're Although really physically similar. For physically, that, that's Valyrian, where it ends. They have that Valyrian look. Yes. Uh, we learn about the unusual Targaryen traditions and idiosyncrasies. 
incest being okay and they can considering s- themselves to be dragons. They do. Yeah. They well, Most places have a sigil. A lot of them have an animal. Yeah. They take it to another level. Yeah. I think one of their ancestors um, drinks dragon fire thinking that it wouldn't kill him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Only to be immediately and Whoops. irrevocably <laughs> disabused. That, that, that didn't work at all. <laughs> and we, we started to learn about Essos and some of their customs and histories. They have painted hair they like lavish clothes and they have slaves that aren't slaves that are considered servants but they are basically slaves and there's also these barbarian dothrakis that we're just starting to find out about they sound pretty interesting i thought it was interesting that they they lived side by side with them i mean what mopadis said about the caldrogo's mans was that they Pent, the citizens of Pentas believed that the city was safe from the Dothrakis because of the red, the, right. the Lord of Light yep. protecting them, but that they made peace with them anyway, just to avoid any conflict. It was interesting. It's interesting that they have easier to just pay them off yeah. or something like yeah. that. So, so, so a continent full of cities that are wealthy and not particularly military and raving lunatics. You know, right. <laughs> <laughs> it seems. What could go wrong there? <laughs> so. That's all for this episode. Yep, Please it. subscribe if you're enjoying it. We'd, yep. uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you at ghosts.harrenhall at gmail.com. That's ghost plural. Ghost plural. Yes. And Harren Hall doesn't end in a double L. No. Nope. It ends in one L. One L. It has a double R in it. Okay. All right. Until next time. Uh-huh. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.